My name is David Snyder, that's Chris Cassano, and as you can see, we're gonna talk about decentralized programmable key pairs. We are the two co-founders of a project called Lit Protocol, and to start with a big, exciting hook, we are living in a world where with threshold cryptography, from a certain point of view, you can consider that private keys no longer exist. So what do we specifically mean by this? This net lit network is essentially a distributed custody programmable key, and one of the key technologies at the heart of this is something called a DKG, a distributed key generation. And so what LIT is specifically is a distributed network of nodes that are custodying shares of an underlying private key. I'll take a quick moment to talk about how security works on this network, and then we'll get into some of the use cases. Um, but essentially, this key is formed uh, in this distributed key generation context and stored as shares across these nodes. And then all of the nodes operations take place inside of a trusted execution environment. And then there are named node operators who are staking uh, that are running the programs on this underlying key. And so now let's talk about what some of those programs can be. So as you know, a key uh, can functionally do two things. It can read or encrypt and write and this network provides the same functionality in a programmatic way. So let's talk about how the read works first. Uh, the hexagons in the middle represent the lit nodes. Uh, in this case, Alice, let's say, is a creator and wants to say anybody who owns uh, Alice's NFT can see her video. She would encrypt that video client side and store it somewhere in public, whether it's on a blockchain or a storage network like IPFS, and then create a set of rules that says only somebody who owns Alice's NFT can see that video. Bob owns that NFT, he shows up later, he signs a message and he broadcasts that to the nodes. Each of the individual nodes validates against the blockchain, does Bob own that NFT? And the whole kind of frame of view here is thinking about these public storage, uh, excuse me, public state machines as access control lists. At which point the nodes verify that Bob has that node, or excuse me, has that NFT, and each of the individual nodes produces something called a decryption share. You could think about this like an authorization. Those authorizations are then sent to Bob, who's collecting them client side. And a good mental model is kind of similar to the way that you may think about torrenting. You know, torrenting, you're collecting little bits of media from a bunch of nodes. In this case, you're collecting bits of authorization. And once you've collected a threshold of those authorizations, in this case, decryption shares, Bob can reproduce that symmetric key associated with the video or that content and decrypt that uh, client side. And so some of the applications that we're seeing this used for today are things like token-gated uh, social media, like token-gated chat. Uh, this technology is used hand-in-hand -hand a lot with like the Lens protocol, for example, where only let somebody who's following me on, on Lens see my posts. We also see this in, uh, happening in the context of intellectual property, whether it's token-gated videos uh, or various other content. And then, uh, really excitingly, there's also been a lot of stuff around verifiable credentials and selective disclosure. So I'm sure you all are familiar with the notion of like signing in with Google as an authorization method for how one logs into a site. Uh, what we're starting to see is some teams build this out in a much more kind of user sovereign type of way, whereby when a user goes logs into a site, they're conveying decryption rights or quote the read rights uh, to that application to see their private information. And it starts to become like a pretty interesting picture and we'll talk more about um, what this, this user owned web looks like. But in a way, this is kind of one definition of Web3, where the user, rather than necessarily showing up to a website with their own kind of self-sovereign server, they're arriving with their own encrypted shard of the open web, and then selectively disclosing to various friends or applications what information from that shard they can decrypt or read. And so this uh, product has been out since January. Um, we still are running all the nodes centrally, and we'll have those decentralized by the end of the year. Um, and there's hundreds of applications that are leveraging this. But just last week, uh, we started um, talking publicly about a uh, new capacity, which is the ability to essentially do distributed custody programmatic signing. 
And as you can see, the architecture is incredibly similar, but instead of the nodes reading the blockchain as an access control list, they are reading programs that are stored at a specific CID on IPFS. Each of those nodes is running those programs. And now in this case, instead of producing the decryption share, which lets that party decrypt uh, some content, they're producing a signature share. Again, coming back to the idea that keys can functionally do th two things, kind of encryption and signing, and then those shares can be aggregated and you can make a write to your favorite decentralized state machine, like Ethereum. And so talking about some of the applications for this, there's a huge list, right? Thinking about the a key as an application development platform, we kind of like think about it as a paintbrush. We're really just starting to explore some of the application potential here, but I'll run through a couple right now. So one would be like DeFi automation. The state of the art for self-custody DeFi today is if you have some staked tokens and you have to, the state of the art is to sign up for some DeFi alerting service such that when the price starts to drop, you get a text, you have to wake up in the middle of the night and push a button on your ledger. Uh, but in a world where you've staked those tokens from one of these cloud wallets, as we can kind of call them, um, you could have that program listening to a feed, and when the price drops, have a program that kicks off that unstakes the tokens, sells them for USDC on a DEX, and sends them to your ledger. And this is all happening kind of without a human signer in the loop, because the key is custodied in this distributed context uh, at the network level. Chris will talk a little bit more about vaults, but in a way, what we're talking about here is making private keys liquid. So you could send a bunch of NFTs and tokens to a given address, and then trade the underlying ownership of that address. Um, there's also a lot to explore here as it relates to account abstraction, doing things like hooking up a biometric auth, like Apple Pass Key as the auth method into one of these cloud keys uh, in this whole context of how do we bring the next billion users into this ecosystem and abstract away the complexity associated with the seed phrase. This is really exciting and certainly a lot to explore in the context of cross-chain messaging and bridging as well. And so with that, I'll pass this clicker off to Chris. Thank you, David. Uh, yeah, so I'd like to introduce the idea of a decentralized programmable key pair, which we call PKPs. A PKP is an ECDSA key pair that's held as private key shares, um, custodied by the lit nodes. You can create a PKP by minting an NFT that represents ownership over that PKP. And so whoever owns that NFT can ask the PKP to sign anything on their behalf, including Ethereum or even Bitcoin transactions. You can do this by writing some JavaScript code that we call a lit action. So this is a really basic hello world uh, lit action. It literally signs the string hello world uh, with ECDSA. And what happens is this code will be run on all the lit nodes in parallel. Lit actions uh, live on IPFS and are immutable, just like smart contracts. And um, I just explained that whoever owns the PKP NFT can request a signature using the PKP. But what's actually more interesting is that you can also grant the ability to sign using your PKP to a lit action. This is very similar to the token approval pattern that we use on Ethereum, where you can grant a smart contract the ability to transfer your tokens. But instead of granting the ability to transfer tokens, you're granting the ability to sign anything with this programmable key pair. So here's how it actually works. Uh, the user can create a lit action execution request, which you can see at the top there. Oops, wrong button. Um, I think I had a laser, cool. Um, and uh, they pass in an IPFS CID, which is some JavaScript code, and a cryptographic signature that could come from their Ethereum wallet, um, an Apple Pass key, um, or any public key cryptography scheme. They send that execution request to all of the lit nodes in parallel. The lit nodes use a JavaScript runtime to execute the lit action from IPFS. They check the PKP authentication by talking to uh, a blockchain where the PKP NFT lives. Um, and the lit action can also uh, make arbitrary HTTP requests. So it can also act as a kind of oracle. Um, it can also act as a kind of oracle. 
Um, so you, you can pull any data in and use it in your JavaScript lit action. Um, the lit action can request a signature using the threshold private key share. That creates a signature share that gets sent um, down to the user that initiated the request. They could be using a browser, or this could be like a server-side client. Um, they combine those signature shares, and they broadcast that signed transaction to Ethereum or any ECDSA blockchain. And I'm talking about a transaction here, but um, it doesn't actually have to be a transaction. It could be any signed data, um, like a write on a ceramic or anything else like that. An interesting pattern that Lit supports is called mint grant burn. The idea is that you mint a PKP, grant it the ability to use a Lit action, then burn the PKP in a single atomic transaction. This means that the PKP can only ever be used by that Lit action, because burning the PKP makes it impossible to use the PKP for signing anything else. A kind of fun toy example would be creating a lit action that takes any number as input, but will only sign that number if it's prime. Since anyone can check that the signature matches the public key of the PKP, they know that any number signed by the corresponding private key must be prime. And the signature acts like a proof that the number is prime. You end up with a kind of prime number certification system. This can be used to create a proof of any JavaScript code execution. And this is kind of similar um, to how ZK proofs work conceptually. But instead of being proven by pure math, it's proven by the guarantees provided by threshold, threshold cryptography via the lit network. And here's kind of how that works. The, um, the way that you interact with and grant access to use things is by talking to a PKP smart contract um, that currently lives on Celo, but we're going to move that to Polygon soon. And you mint the PKP, grant access for it to use the lit action in this authorized lit action table, and then you burn it all in one transaction. Uh, we talked a little bit about using a PKP as a vault. You can mint a PKP, then send a bunch of assets to it, like NFTs, tokens, Ethereum, and even ones not on Ethereum, like Bitcoin or Cosmos tokens. Then you can sell the PKP NFT on OpenSea and transfer all the assets at once. You are essentially trustlessly trading a private key, something that has been impossible until now. This breaks soulbound tokens, because now you can trustlessly sell the wallet that contains your soulbound tokens, in the same way that you could sell a traditional non-soulbound ERC721 NFT. This also enables things like liquid staking for chains that lock up the staked tokens, like Ethereum 2. You could use a PKP as an EOA cloud wallet. Uh, because a PKP can grant the ability to sign to a lit action, you can create any auth method that you want, as long as it's possible to express it in JavaScript. You could create a wallet that will only sign if the user calling the lit action is a member of a DAO. You could use another signature algorithm for verification that's unsupported by Ethereum, like ED25519 or BLS. You could even create a wallet that will only sign transactions on Tuesdays. You can use a PKP for automation. Uh, because the lit nodes do the actual signing, you could create a lit action that checks the price of a token you're staking, and if it drops below a certain price, unstake the token and sell it. This works across chains and could run while you're asleep, you can make any sort of complicated automated trading bot without needing to have a hot wallet sitting on a server somewhere that will get hacked when you forget to update your Linux distribution. And uh, here's some ideas of uh, a lot of different things that you can build. I won't read them all, but yeah. you can we check them out. We could talk about uh, some of these ideas I think is, is worth pointing to, but maybe just to, um, ha a few more metaphors. Like One of the ways that I really like thinking about uh, this programmable key pair notion, what we've been calling a PKP, 
in a way, like the centralized equivalent is thinking about this like an Amazon Lambda function plus the Amazon KMS. But in this case, the KMS isn't something that's centralized. It's uh, distributed across this threshold cryptography-based network, and these lit actions are the equivalent of the lambda, lambda functions. And so it's this distributed system for doing the same type of operations that you would build with a lambda function and Amazon's KMS, um, but in this case, you as the application developer, when you come and bring customers on board, you have this kind of distributed backend where you can't get access to the keys, where if you like build a DeFi automation bot and start selling to somebody as a subscription today, you could jump into Amazon's KMS and grab the keys and the funds out at any point. A couple other interesting things that I think are, are really fun to think about when we start to think about the notion of kind of this cloud key. Uh, there's a lot of implications for this um, as a DAO's key. So we could talk about DAOs and DeFi and, and user-owned social media, but in the context of a DAO, the current state of the art for DAOs is, of course, to use smart contract wallets to manage their treasury, but more and more, especially protocol DAOs, we're seeing things that want to extend cross-chain and cross-ecosystem. And so to start to think about the account abstraction, not at the level of the blockchain, but at the level of the signing algorithm and creating the rules and the governance around this uh, at the level of the signing algorithm starts to get really interesting because you can have the same rules around governance, issuing verifiable credentials for your DAO, making transactions on ETH, doing right to, rights to ceramic, all from the same underlying uh, curve. Um, and then, yeah, I think an, another one that's kind of really uh, interesting here is thinking about uh, this in the context of mainstream adoption. We touched on this a little, um, but it, you know, there's always capacities to add different levels of authorization and security to wallets, uh, but we've been really, really excited about groups that have started to integrate this with the likes of Discord and Apple Passkey, um, and there's definitely a lot of opportunity to build really sophisticating tooling in this ecosystem. It's one of the reasons that we were really excited to give this talk. Like, we have a core team that's super focused on this threshold cryptography component, but there's all kinds of opportunities to like stick an email server inside of an enclave and use that as a methodology for authorizing this with email. That's something that we're not gonna build internally. And so if, that's, if this kind of tooling and privacy tooling and uh, mainstream adoption tooling is something that you're interested in, definitely come talk to us. Um, but yeah, maybe we'll keep this slide up and uh, we'll take uh, questions for the next 10 minutes if there are any. Thanks so much. How do we establish the uh, trust relationship between the client and the the nodes because like anyone kind of like snooping on that can essentially you know rebuild the uh, rebuild the signing or decryption key. Yeah, I mean, uh, right now you pass a cryptographic signature with your request to the lit nodes, so that could be a signed wallet message. Um, like if you want to prove something about your wallet, um, it could be any other cryptographic signature. So it could be you know you using need some encryption, right? Because like you, you, you need to keep no, this. You, you don't need encryption. Private. Just a signature, and the nodes verify the signature. And, and by verifying the signature, they can prove that you own that wallet. Yes, but they're going to send you, in exchange, like a key share, right? Yeah, yeah. They, they don't actually send a key share. They send a decryption share or a signature share. So the, the, the key shares themselves never, uh, never leave the node. Got it. Okay. I think that like I misunderstood this part. And so the the second question that I have is essentially like, can you do in for, any form of uh, resizing of you know this? I wouldn't call it like a quorum, but like you know just this uh, the set. Oh, like uh, changing the set of nodes and changing the threshold, for example. Exactly. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So we use a technology called proactive secret sharing. Um, and what that uh, lets us do is it lets the, uh, the nodes, like new nodes, join and leave the network um, and keep the underlying secret the same, but the private key shares are incompatible uh, between like epochs, when, it, when nodes leave and when nodes join. Basically, okay. the, this process of proactive secret sharing is quite similar to the distributed key generation process. Um, and you know, if you, the, the, the secret uh, is, 
very, very simply put, right, a line on a graph. And in this key refresh process, you're assigning new points along the same underlying secret, such that the shares in Epoch 2 are incompatible with Epoch 1, but they still represent uh, the same underlying secret. And that's functionally the goal of this network, is to persist a shared cryptographic secret in perpetuity. Okay, I think that, that ties into my third question, which is how do you ensure kind of like the any form of like non so like counters so that you know essentially like the number of time that this thing has been signed or like decrypted. Uh, maybe you want to like ensure that like you know you can decrypt it x amount of times. You don't want to you know you you may want to like sequence essentially especially for vaults like operations right like the signing of like specific nonces uh, or like just ensuring that like you you don't have is essentially just like resigning operations with different nonces either. I'm, I'm actually curious, how do you think about that? Yeah, um, so what you could do, so the, the lit nodes themselves are mostly stateless, okay. so they don't necessarily have a place to store anything like that, um, but what you can do in the lit actions is you can read and write from blockchains or from IPFS or wherever, so um, you could, like, at the end of a lit action, after you create the signature share, you could uh, write to a chain to record that a transaction has already happened. Um, and then uh, if somebody tries to run that lit action again, um, it could you know, check and see, like, you know, did this transaction already happen or not? And if so, it, it wouldn't sign. Um, and that, that's like how it works within the lit system. Uh, within like, you know, the, if you're signing an Ethereum transaction, for example, right, you would just include the nonce in the thing to be signed. Um, when you send up like whatever you want to the lit action to be signed. Um, and so then you couldn't reuse that signature, right? Um, because it has already been broadcast with that nonce. Maybe I missed how you explained how to create a P PKP without any keys, but how does that work? And how does the user not have a key and how do they authenticate what things they want the network to do? Yeah, I mean, they need some kind of key, um, right? It could be an Ethereum wallet, or it could be like Apple Pass Key, which is like one click, and they generate a public-private key pair for you that's backed up to your iCloud in an encrypted way. It could also be like potentially a Web2 auth method, like Discord login, um, anything like that. It just needs to be basically um, an authentication method that can be verified by the lit nodes. Every time someone creates a PKP, do you generate a new threshold key? And yes. where is that key stored? Are you spinning up new cloud nodes to store those keys? So the lit nodes, uh, each node support, like, uh, stores multiple key shares. Um, so there's a million keys on the network and 100 nodes. Uh, each of the nodes would store a million key shares, representing one share from each of the underlying cloud wallets or cloud keys. And what kinds of thresholds are you guys using in production, in test? Like, like the number threshold? Like, yeah. we're, we're using two-thirds right now, um, that, and that's like hard-coded across the network, so it's not user-changeable. Um, and uh, yeah, and we're using, uh, you know, ECDSA, non-interactive signing on the, um, the signing side, and then on the encryption and decryption side, we're using uh, BLS keys. Super. We have some more questions in the middle area still. Do you mind if I have one more question? Uh, that's the fourth one, right? Super. <laughs> Uh, what are your plans for decentralization and how do you plan to grow this network? It sounds like it's a pretty fixed set and you do no rotations. Well, so there's this notion of the proactive secret sharing, um, which is not, I guess, not quite a rotation because it's the same underlying secret. Um, but yeah, some of our cutting edge work is right at the notion of changing the threshold, uh, which just be able, makes the network be able to become like more dynamic over time. Uh, but currently there is the capacity for new nodes to join the network and for the key to be refreshed, creating those new shares in Epoch 2, 3, 4, and so on. And then practically in terms of the plan, um, by the end of the year, this network will be up with a handful of named node operators, and then those node operators are functionally a DAO of sorts that decide who comes in and who comes out uh, to the system. Thanks, everybody. Give them applause.